now I'm going to move to the, the, uh, the part of the talk where I give you uh, examples of my own research, and I'll talk about theoretical assumptions, research questions, units of interaction, and what we do with the data. Okay. So this first uh, uh, study was about how teachers explain students' understanding. Okay. And so the kind of theoretical assumption that we have here is that social rea reality is not pre-existing, okay? People are constructing their reality and their interaction all the time, okay? Uh, so uh, we're interested in how teachers and students uh, organize themselves what do they do to learn and to talk together? What are the kinds of things they do? We want to discover that as a researcher. So we're not really supposed to intervene in this case because we want to uh, look at naturally occurring kinds of things. Okay? Now, that's kind of a problem because in this situation, I was working with physics didacticians and they were specifically intervening because they wanted to know uh, when they gave a way of organizing a lesson to teachers, uh, were teachers able to understand students' conceptions? And also, were they able to organize their lesson and analyze what students did okay, with these tools? So um, there was a little bit of a, a, of a problem there in terms of theoretical assumptions. But it really didn't matter in the end, because my research questions were, uh, what are the roles of gaze? Now, this is more like a linguistics thing, okay, when you look at people. What are the roles of gaze and explanations when you, uh, when you interactively explain in a group? And what are the roles of gesture in explanation when you work with like two people, okay? Or a group as well. And the kind of situations here were face-to-face -face and mediated with one computer. So the units of interaction, what we did is we, I, I took videos, I transcribed turns of talk, so I wrote down what people said, and I also wrote down how people looked at each other and how people gestured when they made explanations. Okay, so I did the transcriptions, I'm saying, and I, I sh did graphs showing who looked at whom versus who addressed their speech to whom. So like I can say to Nancy, well, uh, your students, and then I can look at your students, have been very, very interesting, but I'm talking to you, but I'm looking at your students while I'm talking to you. So that's an example of how looking at someone is not the same thing as talking to them, okay? Uh, so the different methods were used were conversation analysis, interaction analysis, content analysis, and um, we want to, you know, show, make explicit how people understand each other. And if I take this kind of uh, way of talking about context, for each uh, study I'll do that, so we were focusing on process, but what kind of a process? The interactive process of explanation, roles of gaze and gesture. So we would have instructions given to the teachers. They had to understand what kids were uh, talking about in a physics lab. So they were looking at videos of children uh, doing physics work. And they were supposed to write together uh, a text about that. Okay a final product that represented their understanding of the student's concepts in physics. And so we were looking at the process, we were looking at explanations, okay? And so we had a meeting of research uh, with teachers and, and didactics physics researchers, and we had a teacher training course in France, okay, as well. So that was our context, very, uh, uh, described on a very general level. So um, if we look at, at how we can relate things, so I was looking for patterns of gaze and gesture that's used during interactive explanation. And I didn't relate it to learning games because I had so much to do by just looking at the process. Okay, I could have. Um, I could have tried to measure how much did teachers learn about students, okay, by, by what they wrote with their text in the end, okay? Um, I didn't do that. I could still do that, but I haven't done it yet. Um, I, I just concentrated on gaze, and I found out that, of course, gaze is used to uh, 
address speech. This is very general uh, kinds of uh, uh, results that are found in the literature. You can acknowledge common ground. I can look at you if uh, I know we uh, know the same thing. I can try to get a reaction from you by looking at you. And this is something that I found that was very interesting, though, and I've worked uh, uh, more deeply on that with some other colleagues, is that gesture can clarify verbal ambiguity. That's something very classical. But also, we've seen how teachers in the classroom and teachers in training situations can reformulate students' gestures. And they do that in order to understand what students are thinking. And I'll show you an example of that. Uh, I wrote a paper in the journal on the top there that shows how, because of this, it's very difficult to get a computer to uh, do any kinds of explaining, or even use a computer to uh, help people explain at a distance, because uh, of these uh, uh, very human ways of talking. Okay, so I'll give you the example here. Now, here you see a... In number one, you see a student. He's talking about the forces in a physics situation. And he's going like this with his hand, like this. He's saying, you'll have air because you'll have a speed movement, he says like this. Is anybody a physics teacher here? <laughs> and so then the, the teacher, after they're in a teacher training situation, and two, these two teachers there on the right, are watching the video of these two students. And teacher uh, one, the, the, the one who's doing the gesture, she says, a speed movement. And she goes like this with her hand. A speed movement. And then uh, in number three, she does another gesture that's a little bit different. And she says, well, he's making speed, maybe. They're trying to understand what the, what the, what the child uh, means by what he's saying. And then in number four, again she says, he makes his hand do a speed movement. Okay? So they're progressing in trying to understand what uh, the student is understanding about physics. And finally in five, now this is kind of strange because the other teacher comes in and she says, for him, speed is movement. Okay, so she sums it up. But she's sitting in her chair and she starts rocking back and forth like this. She says, speed is movement. So she completely changes the gesture. And, uh, and she uh, goes kind of to the essential aspect, which is movement. Okay, it doesn't matter what you're doing, it's just movement. Okay, so the child thinks that speed is movement. So they have collaboratively understood by changing, reformulating between gestures and talk what the student is thinking. Okay, so we've explored that in other situations in the classroom as well, and, we've, and, and it seems to resonate very well with teachers. They understand, uh, um, it's another topic I could do maybe, but. So the general take home message we have on this first uh, study is that uh, through a multimodal reformulation, participants co-construct, and I say the salient characteristics. So what I mean by that is what matters in the gesture, and it's just moving, okay? So what can define a student's conception? And this student thinks that speed is movement. And Nancy will tell us that that's not right. It's, it's not just movement, okay? Speed is not. So we, the kids need to work on this physics concept, okay? So um, in general, human gaze and interactive explanation are driven by speaker intention, so it depends what we want to say and they occur in reaction to what other people do. Uh, and of course, they're also interpreted in relation to inter the inter interactional context. 